Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the EEI MTY Max 2021, second EEI International Conference on Smart Technology. I am Aleksandra Sledziejowska, the EEI Conference Manager of MTY Max 2021. Unfortunately, due to the virus, I am not able to meet all of you in person. So I am using this opportunity to address the organizing committee, the authors and the participants on behalf of EEI. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for being a part of this conference and for your involvement with European Alliance for Innovation. Above all, I would like to express my gratitude to the General Chairs Leticia Neira and Francisco Torres Guerrero for their hard and excellent work throughout the whole process of the conference preparation. During today's event, you can actively participate by joining the Q&A on Slack through a link that you can see below this video. Upon accessing the EI MTY Max 2021 Slack workspace, you can enter the channel called Discussion. To sum up, it is our honor to organize this year's edition of MTY Max Conference. I hope you will have a wonderful time during this event and that you will follow the next edition in 2022. We will keep you posted and the news about this event will be available on the conference website. Should you be interested in being a part of the organizing committee or the technical program committee, please do not hesitate to contact me at my email address below. Similarly, if you are interested in discussing other possible cooperation, organizing a conference or a workshop, please contact me at my email address as well. Thank you for your attention and enjoy EI MTY Max 2021. Hi everyone, my name is Michal Dudic. I'm the Committee Manager at EEI, European Alliance for Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you at this conference uh, and say a few words about who we are and what we can do for you and your research career. In short, EEI is a global community for a greener, healthier and smarter world. As of today, we are home to more than 60,000 members from 167 countries and we reach out to tens of thousands of subscribers. As an organization, we are nonprofit from day one, and what is most important to us is that we remain open to all researchers from all around the world thanks to membership that is completely free. We organize more than 100 events annually, such as this conference, and we do so in publishing partnership with Springer. I said in the beginning that EAI is a community, so let's talk about what that means and what it means for you. To put it briefly, we give our members a platform that builds their research. We do it with three main online community services where members come together to help each other write a better paper, get an objective review, and get recognized fairly. The three services in question are EAI Compass, Community Review, and EAI Index. Firstly, EAI Compass is an online app where you can meet and connect with new colleagues and get feedback on your paper as well as your presentation. In addition to that, it lets you download all full papers that will be presented at this conference and you can vote on your favorite presentations as well as see everyone who is here and connect with them. You can do this right now if you go to EAI Compass website, compass.eai.eu. Next, we are improving the classic conference review process with community review. It has already been in use at all our events since 2019 and we were very excited to hear a lot of positive feedback from program committee members regarding the reliability and the speed of the community review. Let's talk briefly about what community review does. Essentially, it is a website that shows abstracts of papers that are right in the middle of the review process, as long as the authors allow it, of course and all EEI members may then bid to review specific papers. When they submit their bid, they put in their bio and their qualifications, which are sent to the program committee, who can then decide whether or not this bidder is qualified to review the paper they bid on. This relatively easy access to review opportunities means that bidders really need to put their best foot forward if they wish to be selected, which improves the quality of the entire review process. At the end of the day, this benefits you, the author. And last but not least, let me tell you a thing or two about EAI Index. 
EAI Index is our credit-based evaluation system that we rolled out this year to all of our conferences and journals that allow you to climb the global ranks of EAI community and get recognized for your work. It calculates a number value for most actions you make, such as getting your paper accepted or submitting a review, and these numbers accumulate for 12 months. At the end of this 12-month period, we put together a ladder of all EEI members and the ones at the top receive a nomination to one of the membership ranks, senior member, distinguished member, or fellow. For each action that is eligible for EEI index credits, we'll look at the quality of your action as it was evaluated by another member of the community, such as, for example, the review score of your submission. To make sure that the system is fair to newcomers, every 12 months the credit count gets erased, the ones at the top receive their nominations, and every member starts at zero for the following 12 months. And finally, Smart Submit is a collaboration feature that is coming later this year. It will allow you to submit your research ideas and your work in progress abstracts to get the kind of help and feedback you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for co-authors, maybe you would like to find a mentor or a mentee, or maybe you want to find out how the community feels about your idea. This is what Smart Submit is designed for. Ultimately, it's about helping you write a better paper and increasing your chances of getting accepted. Again, we will be launching this feature later this year, so stay tuned. And so I'm going to leave you with many different ways to get engaged at different levels. There are lots of opportunities in many of our events and publications, which means many ways to connect with people and collaborate. You may learn more about everything I just talked about at our website, eai.eu. These services exist to help you and to make your lives easier, so we encourage you to send us your comments, ideas, and feedback to community at eai.eu. And if you're interested in volunteering and contributing, you can let us know at the same email address. Don't forget that you can use EAI Compass to vote on presentations in real time to determine which ones are the best, as well as to download all full papers that will be presented today. Just make sure that you log in using the same email address as the one you used to register to this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please enjoy the conference and I hope we will see everyone online soon. Today, I will be talking about a research topic, which is fusion of digital mammography with a high-resolution breast PET as an application to breast imaging, where Lilian Resendiz, Luis Martín Torres Treviño, and Gisela Estrada has collaborated. In our today's agenda, we will cover different topics. I will first introduce the motivation and key aspects of techniques we covered, and then the purpose of this research. Then I will give you some background of breast cancer screening and technologies such mammography and high-resolution breast PET that use medical image to detect breast cancer. 
Also, I will cover fusion of mammography and high resolution breast bed principles. Additionally, I will show you the, uh, the results of the fusion between these two modalities. I will describe the possible application of deep learning in this research for cancer detection purposes. Then I will conclude. According with the World Health Organization, breast cancer is a top cancer in women, both in the developed and the, the developing world. Although some risk reductions may be achieved with prevention, these strategies cannot eliminate the majority of breast cancer that develop in low- and middle-income countries where breast cancer is diagnosed in very late stages. Therefore, early detection in order to improve breast cancer outcome and survival remains the cornerstone of breast cancer control. Breast cancer is most commonly found on a mammogram. Mammograms, unfortunately, like most diagnostic tests, they are not perfect and can't always catch the cancer. In fact, up to one in five women can have their cancer missed on a mammogram. There are two main challenges with diagnosing breast cancer with a mammogram. The first is a false negative or missing cancer. There is the other side of the equation, which is a false positive, which means we think they have cancer when they don't actually have cancer. Molecular imaging has evolved over the past two decades to become an integral step in the evaluation of patients with different types of malignant tumors. PET scans are widely used for detecting tumors in cancer in human body. It works through injecting radioisotope into the patient's bloodstream via a covered molecule such as glucose. The radio tracer accumulates in body tissues with a high energy demand, especially tumors. Radiopharmaceutical moves from the blood vessels into surrounding tumor cells. The atom decay within the tumor cells emitting a positron. This positron react with nearby electrons in an annihilation reaction, producing a pair of gamma rays in opposite directions. Pair of gamma rays are detected by the gamma camera in the PET scanner. Areas of tumor tissues can be seen on the PET scan. The high resolution breast PET is an equipment that is specifically designed for breast examination and is characterized as a technique that offers a graded spatial resolution that allows to detect smaller lesions. It is shown that the fusion of the breast PET with mammography imaging allows for more accurate evaluation by fusing anatomical location with functional imaging. The molecular image is obtained from the images from breast positron emission tomography and it captures enough information to recognize possible oncological lesions at an early stage or not seen in the mammography that can be subjected to quantitative evaluations for their detection, characterization and monitoring. In interest of improving lesion detection, the purpose of this study is the use of heterogeneous data sets of high-resolution breast PET with mammography images in a fused image to support the breast cancer imaging diagnostic process and demonstrate that by applying various processing te te techniques, it is possible to correlate metabolic information to recognize important breast findings. The use of heterogeneous Datasets is intent to provide support for a correct clinical diagnosis can even perform the classification of findings that allow the identification of the oncological lesion in malignant and benign groups through the selection, extraction, and classification of characteristics in the fused image. Screening mammography is promoted as a key to continue reduction of breast cancer mortality through early detection. Several organizations, including the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society, and the American College of Radiology, 
currently recommend routine exams every one to two years for women over 40. Historically, in the practice of nuclear medicine, medical specialists visually evaluate images for the detection and monitoring of breast carcinomas. There is no doubt that the evaluation of patient information and expert judgment is the most important factor in image-based diagnosis. However, there are many factors that affect this type of diagnosis. Among the factors are the presence of noise in the images, the ability of visual perception from the physician, inadequate clarity, poor contrast, and the physician experience, of course. Some benefits of high-resolution breast PET are can detect 1.5 millimeters lesion. It is used to evaluation of unknown primary cancer. It is a secondary screening options for high-risk patients. It is a secondary screening for dense breast tissue. It is used when in equivocal findings in conventional mammography. It is used as monitor for recurrence and it is not affected by either breast density or hormonal status. Fusion process refers to the combination of the information of two data sets related to the same scene coming from different sources in order to obtain a new or more exhaustive knowledge of the same. The fusion provides morphological and metabolic information to distinguish hand-recognized breast cancer, the role of high-resolution breast PET images in the characterization of breast cancer was evaluated and found oh, a significant correlation between advanced imaging features and the histological type making suitable as a complementary role for characterization of breast cancer lesions. Remember that the breast cancer cells have a higher metabolism than normal ones and exhibit increased absorption of the red tracer. The fusion of these two modalities is an optimum choice since it provides morphological information for variants of breast cancer and non-malignant condition to the metabolic information from breast PET. Do conventional nuclear medicine and radiologic breast images acquired at different times with different patient positions, it was proposed an arrangement that simplifies the image registration process by allowing a breast metabolic image to be acquired immediately after performing an X-ray mam mammogram. Do conventional nuclear medicine and radiology breast images acquired at different times with different patient positions, we developed a co-registration tool to obtain accurate co-registration of metabolic and x-ray images of the breast. The database was retrospectively reviewed for 100 female patients with a suspicious breast lesion on mammography or clinical background. All breast PET images were reported by a nuclear medicine physician. The characterization of the images included breast density, uh, right, left, or bilateral lesion, multifocality, multicentricity, and extension or intraductal component. Digital imaging and communication in medicine DICOM protocol is used as a standard representation, communication, and storage of medical image and related information. We have implemented a tool for medical image registration that allows establishing correspondences between features in two sets of images by uh, using a rigid transformation model. The utilization of grassroots DICOM library was chosen as a framework library. This is a standard craniocaudal view of a mammography image with a category of right street at the left. At the middle, we have a high resolution breast PET image, and at the right, we have a fuse image previously registered. This is a patient with antecedent of ductal infiltrating carcinoma treated with a tumorectomy. And the fusion image shows that 18 FDG uptake near to the surgical staples and 
a multifocal lesion. These images correspond to the mediolateral oblique view of a mammography image at the left. At the middle, we have the high-resolution breastplate image and at the right, the fused image previously registered. Upper images correspond to the left breast and inferior images correspond to the right breast. This is a patient with mother and sister with breast cancer. Uh, also, the category is b rates 3 and the fusion image shows a uh, focal 18 FDG uptake in both breasts. That means bilaterality. This is a mediolateral oblique view of a mammography image with density category D at the left, breastbed image at the middle, and the fused image at the right. This is a patient with antecedent of a growing lymph nodes in the axilla with two negative biopsies, surgical staples, and the fusion image shows uh, actin FDG uptake in the upper quadrants. This is not suspected in the mammography. These images correspond to the mediolateral oblique view of a mammography image with one lesion in the inferior quadrant at the left. At the middle, we have a half resolution PET image and at right, the fused image that shows that 18 FDG uptake in the same lesion shown in the mammography plus two other lesions in the upper quadrants. That means multicentric lesions. This is the last example. Here we have a standard craniocaudal view of a mammography image at the left. At the middle, we have a breastbed image and at the right, the first image previously registered in a patient with breast implants. In the domain of breast cancer, we have such an opportunity to have a significant impact on individual lives in large populations of women in their lives. So, what we are really intent on doing this is how we can leverage the tools of AI to improve patient care experiences and improve patient outcomes. You will hear a lot of people in AA that you sort of get the feeling that they're building a bunch of hammers and they're going to figure it out where the nails are later. Uh, we're really starting with uh, what are more pressing problems. When we look in at the mammograms, the question is uh, one that comes up to all of us in mammography. Um, could this have been seen the year before? But is that thing we see, is it different than all of those other white splotches all over the mammogram? So will we just be calling back every woman saying, well, we can roll out the cancer here, here, and here, but we still wonder if with the power of really smart, fast computers, could we analyze these changes over time differently? And also, could we think about this concept of we are telling you uh, your breast density, this sort of increases your risk, but not a lot. And most women can uh, have you no, half of women have dense breast tissue. Could we do better with an artificial intelligence? We wanted to make sure that the tools that we are developing would spread around the world. And we didn't want to AI to be yet another example in healthcare where new te technologies divides rather than unites the full diversity of patients whom we serve. The question was, if computers could read mammograms, could the impact and power of a screening mammography to reduce breast cancer deaths be realized? We are ready to do in mammography, I we also wondered, so that would be an area we were taking smart computers to do something that humans are doing, looking at the mammograms to find cancer. There's another domain as, what if you could take computers to do things that humans actually can do? So humans can see density, but they can look at mammograms and say 25% lifetime risk, 10% lifetime risk, but could computers do uh, that could 
they ex extract more data out of the mammogram than just something that's occurred as dense, not dense. And in fact, in the same ways that you, our risk models are very limited. Now, because most risk models have been developed on European Caucasian women, they don't work very well in an African American and Asian and Hispanic woman. We do more than with AI taking big data and predicting the future better. Every mammogram is like the face of every woman. Give us information about these hidden treasures and the mammograms that we can pull out with our human eyes, but we think that really smart computers are able to do that. The field is called radiomics. We hear about genomics or proteomics, but there is information within the image and before AI, you just uh, don't think we could put that out whether it's a mammogram or an ultrasound or an MRI. So every woman's mammogram is unique. So the mammogram don't look the same and just be like if you put a woman's face up and the other woman's face like uh, those are two different women. So we wanted to leverage that and all of that digital data that we know around the world have been collecting for decades. It's therefore the taking a lot of work to annotate and have high quality data and image to do this AI work. Although there are several imaging options capable of identifying and defining breast cancer, the fusion of breast PET combined with mammography can provide additional information for the detection of the primary relations. Breast PET measures metabolism and mammography images offers anatomical reference through different views of each breast that can be evaluated together by the interpreting physicians. Merging both techniques allows to the anatomical localization related to the functional image. The fused image can be obtained through the application of conventional image analysis and processing techniques as well as artificial te intelligent techniques. Breast PET and mammography are synergistic and complementary for the detection of a small breast cancer, especially in patients with dense breast. Do the literature evidence the fusion of breast PET findings with mammography allows to identify the primary relations in dense breast, multifocal disease, multicentric disease, bilaterality, or ductal involvement. Integrating information between this image could increase its sensitivity and accuracy, also the specificity, uh, positive predictive value, and accuracy of mammography in diagnostic work of breast cancer. If you have further questions or want to discuss any of it in more detail, we can meet privately or you can send me an email. Thank you. This is the presentation of the paper towards the comprehensive detection of fake news in social digital media in Mexico with machine learning. Authors Carlos Augusto Jiménez Zárate and Leticia Amalia Neira Tovar. This research is a review of the literature of investigations that have used machine learning and other techniques or methods such as natural language processing text classification and neural networks for the detection of fake news to develop an algorithm for the automatic detection of fake news in the social digital content broadcast in Mexican Spanish. Introduction According to the 15th study on the habits of internet users in Mexico, presented by the Internet MX Association, 
it revealed that internet users in Mexico were 82.7 million, and that of these 82% are users who use the internet to access social networks. 76% of users use the internet to search for information. On Twitter, content dissemination campaigns have been generated or developed with negative aspects such as the spread of disinformation, fake news, the use of bots or automated digital positioning systems or the dissemination of negative or hateful content, as indicated Stella et al. Monster et al. determined that social digital networks generate structures that propagate content or information, which can be analyzed with greater efficiency through complex contagion models and also assume that the probability of content adoption depends on the number of unique sources of information. In this context, the complex contagion of content propagation, bots can be targeted as new, dis new disseminators with erroneous information, disinformation or fake news. The right to review to guide the investigation on the construction of a system for the detection of fake news on Twitter in Mexico, this investigation has condensed the most relevant investigation that can help its development. Shaw et al. analyzing 14 million tweets, where 400,000 articles were shared during 10 months between 2016 and 2017. Through their analysis, they managed to find evidence that much of the misinformation is due to superpropagators that are social bots that publish automatic links to articles. The analysis tools they used were the Hoxi and the Borometer Verification Systems, which were developed by researchers at Indiana University. Visceral, developers of the Bot or Not system claim that the classifier generates more than 1,000 characteristics through the use of metadata and information extracted from patterns and the content of the interaction. Detection of fake news is not easy. It requires models and systems that can summarize and compare the news with reliable sources to be able to categorize them. That is why alternatives are sought, such as identifying the position through the automatic detection of the relationship between two pieces of a text. Tora et al. developed a model where they use the deep learning architecture of neural networks with vectorization through a bag of words with a dense neural network to be able to categorize the positions, the model showed good results to categorize the headings and the new articles or news. Altum Bayeral compared more than 20 supervised artificial intelligence algorithms for the classification of fake news and determined that the decision tree algorithm obtained a better result. Posara et al conduct an investigation to detect fake news in the Spanish language, for which they create a new dataset of the content broadcast on Twitter by formal media and media that regularly publish false content. They use four algorithms for classification machine learning, which they were support vector machine, logistic regression, random forest and boosting. We in this review, very few investigations focused on the detection of fake news for the Mexican Spanish language were found. In Table 1, which summarizes the investigations that are considered relevant due to methods for the construction of an efficient system for the detection of fake news in Twitter Mexico networks. As you can see, some are Shao et al. Hoxie, a platform for tracking online misinformation that as a method uses extraction of tweaks containing the URLs of the websites. Sotha et al. Fake news detection a deep learning approach. They use three different neural networks architectures with the TFID vector representation of combined words being the best performing one. Then we have Posara et al. Detection of fake news in a new corpus for the Spanish language. They create a new dataset of formal media and sites that regularly post fake news. They use machine learning algorithms such as support vector machine, logistic regression, and random forest and boosting. Sizar et al. Aggressive identification and fake news detection based on textual features for Mexican Spanish. 
They use the dataset from the MEX A3T Natural Language Processing Assessment Forum. And for classification, they use the Natural Language Toolkit for tokenization and stop word removal. For the training of their model, they use of cross-validation with learning algorithms. So et al. Safe. Similarly, a war multimodal fake news detection. They use a multimodal approach that integrates the visual text analysis of the news to be able to categorize them as true or false. The dataset was obtained from news verification sites in the US. Independent variables for the development of this research will be A. Tweet text B. Text of the news C. Broadcast users D. Propagation of the tweet The depends variables will be the following for the text of the tweet and the text of the news that is contained in the URL of the tweet. A. Fake news B. Satire C. Propaganda D. Real news Here we can see the relation that exists between the independent variables and depend variables. Development phases. The first phase of the proposed system for detecting fake news on Twitter Mexico with machine learning will be the creation of a dataset of tweets. The second phase consists in partitioning the data obtained into dataset. The first partition will contain 7% for the training dataset, and the second partition will contain 30% of the dataset for the test dataset. The third phase will consist of analyzing and categorizing the users who participate in the dissemination and propagation of the tweets contained in the dataset. The fourth phase of analysis will consist of analyzing the spread of the content. The fifth phase will integrate the different analyses and the categorization in a matrix that shows us the results of the proposed variables. Here we can see Table 2, Project Calendar for the Construction of the Algorithm for the Detection of Fake News in the Social Digital Networks in Mexico. The boxes in green are the actions that have already been carried out. Conclusion The literature review found that studies and research on the detection of fake news with machine learning or artificial intelligence techniques have been carried out mainly in the English language or with translators. The most used techniques for the classification and the detection of fake news have been those of SBM, logistic regression, and decision tree and naive bias. The research proposed will be useful in the first place for the detection of fake news that is disseminated in social networks, and it will also be a tool that helps to report content detected as fake news in the various social digital networks. The system can also be of great help in the development and monitoring of social communication strategies for any type of organization, business, social, governmental or political. The use of this algorithm would be useful to improve the veracity of the contents in the social digital networks. In the following slides, you can see the reference that were used for this project.
Hello, my name is Arturo González Mendoza, and the subject of my talk is Surface Electromyography Classification of Upper Limb Movements Under Different Loads. This talk will be in four parts. In the first part, we will talk a, a little bit about surface electromyography and their use in human machine interfaces and a little bit about previous works. In the second part, I will describe the materials, experimental setup and signal processing use. Then I will show the obtained results and finally, I will give our conclusions. Surface electromyography has been used as input for human machine interface to recognize the user's body movements and translate them into machine commands. Some human machine applications using surface electromyography include the control of bionic hands, rehabilitation devices, and assistive devices. One of the critical elements of human machine interfaces that use surface electromyography as input is body movement classification. The body movement classification process can be divided into three stages. The first stage is signal preprocessing. In this process, the surface electromyography signal is filtered to remove the artifacts and then is digitalized. In the, sec the second stage is feature extraction. Feature extraction plays an essential role in classification, accuracy, and feasibility. In this stage, several features from time domain, frequency domain, and time frequency domain are calculated over the surface electromyography signals. Usually, time domain features, which are less computational complex to calculate, are preferred over frequency domain features. The third stage, which is the classifier model training, uses as input the features that were calculated. In this third stage, the training of numeral classifier models have been performed on feature extracted from support vector machine, can nearest neighbors, decision trail, or assemble methods. On occasions, compu computationally simpler classification methods are preferred over more accurate but more complex ones due to their low processing time, making them more feasible to be applied. Some previous works that are considered important for this work is the 2018 Sanet al. article, where he compared four machine learning classifier models to identify four waste movements using 42 time domain frequency domain and time frequency domain features calculated from surface electromyography signals of four waist muscles. In this article, it is found that muscle selection has a direct impact on classifier model accuracy. In the 2020 McDonald et al. article, he studied eight muscles and eight movements, nine time domain features were classified. In this article, it is concluded that Two time domain features of surface electromyography, that are the root mean square and the moving average, are enough for detecting movement direction with a 100% accuracy in nine able body subjects. It's important to mention that in physical therapy, resistant exercises where the user feels the effect of additional loads while performing movement are frequently used. According to Von Berth, the influence of external loads on muscle control is reflected on surface electromyography signals. Previous works have classified body movements through surface electromyography signals with good results, but none have considered the effect of different loads felt by the user. This paper aims to evaluate the accuracy of supervised learning algorithms for the classification of surface electromyography signals under different loads. In order to facilitate the explanation of the methodology, the methodology is divided into four sections. First, we will explain the measurement setup, then I will explain the data acquisition, and I will continue describing the signal preprocessing, and finally, we'll talk about the model classification training and feature reduction test. The three measurement setups proposed in this article are based on the 2016 article of Von Verde. 
Oh, in all the measurement setups, a pulley machine is used to apply a constant external load. A deflection pulley with a radius of 4 cm is connected to the pulley machine through a bar and in the same axis of the, of the deflection pulley machine, the joint under S2D is aligned. In the case of the elbow and wrist flexion and extension movements, which are depicted in figure 1 and figure 2, the user is, an, is aligned in an upright position in parallel to the pulley machine and the joint is aligned to the, to the deflection pulley machine. In the case of the wrist medial lateral deviation movement, the user is seated in front of the pulley machine and a table is used with the velcro straps to attach the arm in order to avoid uh, movements. To record the kinematics of the movements, a 13 camera OptiTrack system that recorded up to a 100 Hz was used. The reflective markers were placed according to the standard baseline upper body that used 25 markers. The muscles to obtain the electrical activity and their placement is the next. The biceps brachii long head and triceps brachii long head electroplacement was done according to the surface electromyography of, for the non invasive assessment of muscles, FENIAM recommendations. The triceps brachii lateral head flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, extensor carpi radialis, and extensor carpi ulnaris, and the brachioradialis electrodes were placed according to the anatomical guide for the electromyography because there are no senium recognitions for their placement. They were recorded up to a velocity of 1 kHz with a biometrics data log system. The data acquisition was performed on a subject with an age of 29 years old, considered healthy. For each movement, the user performed elbow flexion extension, wrist flexion extension, and wrist medial lateral deviation over the entire range of their motion of each joint at the following cadence, 3 cycles in 2 seconds, 4 cycles in 1 second, and 5 cycles in 0 0.5 seconds, and 6 cycles in 0 0.5 seconds, the user was asked to rest for 60 seconds between each set of cycles to avoid fatigue. This procedure was done with the following movements and external load, elbow flexion extension at 0 0.5, 2.5 and 5 kilograms, the waist flexion extension at 0.5 at 2.5 kilograms and the waist medial lateral deviation at 0 and 0.5 kilograms. External loads of 0.5 and 2.5 and 5.0 kilograms equal to the torques of 0.08, 0.4 and 2 newton meters respectively. For a 4 centimeter radius, deflection pulley, loads were chosen based on the subject capabilities to perform a full set of maneuvers without fatigue. Once the kinematic signals were obtained, an inverse kinematic analysis in order to obtain the joint angles were, was performed with the OpenSIM software. The joint angles were resampled to 1 kHz and then a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 5 Hz was applied. In the case of the surface electromyography, a bandpass Butterworth filter with cutoff frequency of between 40 and 450 Hz was applied. Then the signal was full wave rectified and normalized to 1. And in order to obtain the envelope of the signal, a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 10 Hz was applied. Then a signal synchronization was done with a correlation process between the kinematics and the surface electromyographic signals. 
After the signal preprocessing, the data was segmented and labeled according to the performed movement. Then a mobile window of 256 milliseconds was created and the features from time domain and frequency domain were calculated. The used features were selected for day frequent use in gesture recognition and are defined next. The integral of the surface electromyography, the moving average absolute value, the simple square integral, the variance, the root mean square, the wavelength of the signal, the median frequency, and the mean frequency. The proposed features were evaluated in four classification models, decision tree with kernel medium tree, can nearest neighbor model with kernel function medium can nearest neighbor, support vector machine model with kernel function of medium Gaussian, and the ensemble model boosted trees. The total number of evaluated samples was of 320,649 samples. Due to the large size of the data set, the 50% held out validation method was used. The preprocessing, the feature extraction, and the classification model training was done in MATLAB 2020. Table 1 shows the accuracy results of five tests performed on classification models. In the first test, the classification models were trained and evaluated with only time domain features from surface electromyography signals. A total of 48 features were evaluated and 14 classes were taken into account. The classes considered the movement with different loads. In the second test, we only used frequency domain features. 16 features were evaluated in total and 14 classes were taken into account. The third test considered the time domain features and the frequency domain features were added. A total of 64 features were evaluated and 14 classes were taken into account. The fourth test was carried out after a feature reduction analysis with principal component analysis. This test consisted on obtaining the classifier model results with the feature of the surface electromyography integral. A total of eight features were evaluated and 14 classes were taken into account. The fifth test uses the reduced set of six classification classes. The external loads were not taken into account. In this test, only time domain features were tested. This test is done to compare the results with previous studies that only consider the movement classification. In all tests, can nearest neighbors and super vector machines are scored the highest accuracy. Comparing results from test 1 and 2, it can be inferred that frequency domain features doesn't contribute to the classification process. Also, from test 5 and compared with previous results in other studies, it can be said that the the accuracy results are according to previous results. In figure 4, we can see the contribution of each feature for each muscle for the classification of movement. In this case, the feature that contributes the most is the integral of electromyography in all the muscles. Likewise, the muscles that allow to identify the body movements better are the flexor and extensor muscles. In figure 5 and 6, we can compare the positive confusion matrices. In the figure 5, we can see the decision tree classifier model with medium kernel function with an accuracy of 79.1%, while in figure 6, we can see the candidate's neighbor model with medium kernel function with an accuracy of 99.7%. According to McDonald et al., a classifier model on gesture recognition should have an accuracy of over 90%. This is because in figure, side, in figure 5, we can see that we have many um, false positive um, values, while in figure 6, we can see that the false positive is reduced. 
From the performed classification test, we can conclude that it's possible to discern the surface electromyography feature contribution and investigate the extent to which a set of features can be reduced to a point where high accuracy is reached, resulting in short processing time for human machine interface. Performed test shows that time domain features contribute the most to the classification process, especially the integral of the surface electromyography. In this article, we have demonstrated that low external loads can be identified. This is a good result since it could help subjects with low carrying capacity level. It can be concluded that human machine interface based on surface electromyography can be used for rehabilitation purposes. Thanks for your attention. Hello everybody, my name is Lorraine Sanchez Jimenez and I'm going to present my work, a model of the control of monitoring of supply chain indicators. I'm currently working with Dr. Thomas Alor Salais Fierro. This is the agenda of the presentation, which consists of introduction, literature review, methodology, results, and conclusions. By the way of introduction, the supply chain considers integration of representative functional activities along the network and include business process, people, technology, and infrastructure for the transformation of raw materials into finished products and services. Good supply chain management brings benefits such as increased customer satisfaction, inventory reduction, improved resource utilization, among others. Because of these benefits, companies have chosen the measure supply chain's performance to evaluate the effectiveness of management strategies and practices. Performance management is the process of quantitatively and qualitatively assessing the effectiveness and efficiency of a business activity or process. Assessing the current state of a business allows for the identification of progress and opportunities for improvement. Process evaluation is done through metrics related to various performance objectives, such as cost, agility, responsiveness, flexibility, and sustainability. Therefore, shortcomings in measurement systems are found when they are lack of connection between strategic objectives and metrics. Based centralization in finance and existence of conflicting measures. Excessive metrics and a lack of developmental guidance at different levels and process. Culture of dilutigish between strategy, tactical and operational level metrics. Lack of flexibility and ad adaptation of indicators. Insufficient feedback from indicators. High rates of process variability. Therefore, the objective of this study is to monitor supply chain performance through a predictive evaluation system that minimizes errors and improves business decision making. The literature review was based on the identification of tools or techniques used for evaluations to establish a hybrid model that can ensure performance and feedback into measuring systems. The analysis includes 23 articles classified by techniques, models, and artificial intelligence techniques.
the studies were conducted in the manufacturing, environment, agriculture, construction, service and transport sectors, and the strategies measured were mainly related to sustainability, their supply chains, customer per se value and supply selections and evaluation. The figure shows the summary of the review, the score model, AHP, and physiologic are the predominant ones. A comparative analysis of the application of the models is carried out to identify their characteristics and functionalities and to choose the best option. The SCAR model is ideal for the project because it unifies terms and provides a stand format for describing the supply chain. It evaluates each process with the apparity KPs. It finds opportunities for improvement. It maintains a continuous system of KPI statements and process future improvements. According to the state of the art, the techniques that are simultaneously combining with the model are AHP, simulation topsies. Thus, AHP is integrated because OIS is applicable, simplicity, easy of use, and great flexibility. However, its results are not reliable. Faced with the need to make correct the automated decisions, the application of artificial intelligence techniques is increasingly carried out in case investigation and illustrative tests. Usage to estimate supply chain's performance based on multiple measures to predict the test results. Physiology deal with increased data of the decision making or in certain circumstances. Consequently, the FUSI HHP technique is integrated to overcome the limitations and finally the application of FUSI inference system to deal with uncertain evaluation process is a death. The methodology of the proposed conceptual model starts with the definition of the order of the study, which is, is in the research, the measurement of pursuing process performance in them. It contains three main elements. The first step is the literature review of the main theoretical concepts, sourcing score focusing on sourcing attributes and indicators. FUSI AHP as a purity analysis method and finally the FIS and its applicability to supply chain performance measurement. The second step it is development of the model composed of real indicators associated with the dose of SCARP, followed by the prioritization of the attributes using FUSI AHP. The results of which are the input data for the mathematical formulation of the FIS rules. And finally, the implementation in the step real indicator of figures performance in this of expert collaboration will be used. For the collection of information, the model requires two inputs, actual performance indices and expert knowledge to include the particular of companies. The proposed model established a cyclical structure for the continuous improvement of performance indicators. The three steps of the present model are outlined below. The first step is the identification of sourcing focus indicators as shown in the picture. The second step is the inferred sourcing values. This one calculates a hill from the compressing indicators the rule based and membership function of the first phase are paralyzed according to the experts' perceptions and the process performed by the FUSI HAP. For FIS2, the same procedure is performed for the ASME management attribute. Finally, FIS3 calculates the value of the provision of the five inputs. In this step, the linguistic technology of the FUSI members of the input and output variables are also defined. In the third step, E scenario simulations are performed using the surface provided by the classification of provising performance as an exact number. The surface are based on the figure showing the performance behavior as a function of the attributes. 
each surface indicates the performance of the combination of two attributes. Consequently, ten comparative surfaces are generated. The result of the simulation makes it possible to visualize which attribute has the greatest impact on the pressure and which ones has deficiencies. Thus, it's possible to make the necessary changes in the model and in the process carry out in the procurement of obtain better performance results. Furthermore, with the result, it will be possible to make improved decisions. The proposed predictive performance systems allows the following results to be obtained. Association of the indicators using the company with those of score and conversation of theories to arrange that enables comparative measurements. By means of the FAP methodology, performance attributes in prosmen are categorized with the help of expert judgments. This results together with the conversation of the both figures from the basis of the PEACE standards. With the application of the PEACE, 10 comparison surfaces are projected between the attributes of the score model. Reality versus agility. Reability versus cost. Reality versus asset management. Reability versus responsiveness. Agility versus responsiveness. Agility versus cost. Agility versus asset management. Responsiveness versus cost. Responsiveness versus asset management. Cost versus asset management. These figures express a scenario analysis of sourcing behavior under certain parameters and provide decision makers with information of the impact on the supply chain. The drawbacks associated with the use of fees stem from errors in the definition of linguistic terms and fuzzy numbers, a process that can be complex. The role of Casper is crucial in capturing the characteristics of the supply chain and incorporating them into the rules. Among the main aspect results are a predictive performance evaluation system focused on the preserving area that can anticipate problems a cyclical and adoptable measurement model for any category of the supply chain and the possibility of corrective benchmarking for the structure indicators of the measurement system used by the company. The model and the spec results reinforce the proposition that the adoption of a hybrid predictive system based on the metrics and attributes of the score model with a fab of weight allocation and a fees for evaluation appears to be a viable technique to assist managers in the decision-making process of supply chain performance management. In other way, the system offers the possibility to anticipate and prioritize. Furthermore, the model aims to evaluate the number of indicators used in companies and their purpose with corrective effects. It is designed to consider process variability and is therefore a cyclical model in which simulations can be performed by constantly varying the input data and the expected targets, so it can also be classified as flexible and adaptable to various supply chain configurations. Application of the model in the area case study and validation of the conceptual framework. In comparison of neurofusy approaches in case large amounts of data are handled in the trace system. There are the biographical reference used.
Thank you so much for your attention. Virtual Job Expo, a practical approach to virtual reality in different development engines. First of all, what does virtual reality technically mean? Well, it is a technology that gives us the opportunity to imitate the real environment. It gives us the perception of being somewhere else. Maybe you all have seen the use of this type of technology in video games, museums, or videos. Also, the argumented reality mixes the real environment with virtual elements, creating the illusion that the environment is a mixture of both worlds. However, virtual reality is not only for recreational purposes. It has been basic on education, research, and has replaced activities that require physical effort that trace safety and could be expensive in other ways. Actually, one of the targets of this work is the use of virtual reality into the workforce research, reviewing two platforms that use virtual reality in Jobs Expo. This is exposed with the aim of showing the good opportunity of virtual rapprochement between employers and job seekers. Virtual reality also allows the user to access to remote expert or experiences that are physically impossible or have limited access. This happens through a new generation of more affordable hardware. And some of the benefits for collaborative virtual environments are interaction with other humans and benefits focuses on the environment. For the interaction with other humans, like this jobs expo, the possibilities allow us to interact in a new way with other people and also allows to modify how you can interact with them. The innovation of the environment can be based on physical or theoretical location that maybe only a few people can reach, or for example, being inside a monocle. The virtual job fair consists of offering the user a virtual experience, where the companies can exhibit their stands to enroll students and the students can take a tour to obtain information of their companies. Talking about how anybody can access to this technology, there are some specific set of hardware accessories that are needed to make it possible. For example, head-mounted screens, which consists of two small screens, one for each A, a material used to stop line from approaching to the real world, and a pair of stereo headphones, immersive rooms that represent an alternative. These are lists of areas that contain special projections. For example, tours that turn walls into exhibits, or data gloves that are used to give people the ability to interact with virtual objects, making the experience more realistic. The Virtual Job Fair project was designed to be supported by VR equipment, such as Vive, Rift, Windows Mixed Reality, Daydream, Gear VR, Cardboard, Oculus Go, 360 grades. On the other hand, the software used from the A platform is supported by Spelladium, Firefox, Oculus Browser, Samsung Internet, Microsoft H, from Execute Safari from iOS, from from Android, Firefox for iOS, Samsung Internet, and UC Browser. A frame is a framework from creating virtual reality experiences. It's based on HTML language, which simplifies getting started. 
but a frame is not just a 3D scene graft or a makeup language. The core is a powerful entity complement framework that provides a declarative, extensible, and compostable structure to 3.GS. Has grown into one of the largest virtual reality communities. It's compatible with most VR headsets, for example, Vive, Rift, Windows Mixed Reality, Daydream, Gear VR, Cardboard, Oculus Go, and can even be used for augmented reality. It supports the full spectrum. A frame aims to define full immersive interactive VR experience that go beyond basic 360 grades content, making full use of positional tracking and controllers. The use of three-dimensional representation of geometric data is made up for several fundamental factors. Among them are architecture, physics, electronics, and multimedia. Here, you can see the front of the school area rendered by the 3D department of the Faculty of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. Also, the stance of the companies implemented on the Virtual Work Fair 2020. It is also important to know the framework because it is fundamental to implement the virtual experience. Here, the render, videos, laboratories, and the main events are hosted. For the virtual work fair, the framework Bootstrap was implemented, which is basically an open source multi-platform library. Actually, the first option was Unity 3D because it is extremely powerful from the development engine. It enables the creation, design, and operation of a fully interactive environment for the user. Even if a frame is not as flexible as Unity, it is a complete light and fast tool with compilation size that will not affect the RAM using JavaScript. And this is why it was the best option for this project. In conclusion, there might be thousands of tools that fit our needs. The important thing is to know the real needs of the project, to use the right tool. Because some of them are more powerful, faster or lighter. In the study cases from this project, for example, we find out that Unity, 3D and a frame were the main options from the development. So we can conclude from Unity that has an extensive usability in which if you know how to handle it correctly, you can design any inner element that you imagine. And in the other hand, a frame is a tool, perhaps not so powerful, but that offers a great virtual experience, great adaption, and most importantly, a great compatibility so that practically any user can have an experience with virtual reality. First of all, I want to thank the researcher team who with their knowledge and support has given me through each step for my research to achieve the result I was looking for. In addition to this, we want to thank the work team that made the virtual work fair possible. Oscar Leal, Eduardo Sanchez, Mario Gutierrez, Dana Gomez, Rodrigo Villasusa, Valeria González, Karina Mata. Thank you, you all, for your time.
Virtual Reality Training Simulation for Controlled Land, Unnamed Vehicle, a Facility Model. Abstract. Today, the use of technology is indispensable in daily life. Paint is an important part to facilitate to the greatest extent possible the activities carried out by humans being as an example of the scope that technology has and the ability has become one of the most sophisticated systems with different applications in different environments. This paper presents an overview of a virtual reality VR based training tool for users to get qualified as pilots capable of handling real life unnamed vehicles. This work shows some characters of VR system and the scope is the, to, present, to present the advantages of using virtual reality software as a training tool. Promoting that virtual reality training for use of an unnamed vehicle could be as effective as real life training. Keywords virtual reality, augmented reality, simulation, unnamed vehicle, training software. Introduction. Pioneering organizations such as GA and, Bio and Boeing are using virtual reality VR to improve productivity, quality, and training. By combining the power of humans and machines, VR will significantly increase value creation for organizations. VR is a very high-end computer interface that enables real-time simulation and interface through numerous sensorial channels. These sensorial modalities are visual, oral, tangible, smell, taste, and other sense. On, on its part, augmented reality here is a new technology that involves the overlay of computer graphics on the real world. They both aim to extend the sensorial environment of an individual by magnetic reality talk technology. The former relies on a re alternative settings to experience while the learning improves existence elements with additional layers of meaning. As we can see, these have many similarities difference as well. In this work, we are going to focus on VR systems. VR is known as technology that makes it possible for people and experiences on a world beyond reality. Such technology comes in different ways and says, with the aim of giving information of, to our sense, sight, hearing, and touch. Since this one qualifies better for its characteristics for the project VR system, the characteristics of immersive the user in a virtual world that can be created according to the characters we want it to have. Method. Virtual reality VR uses simulation and displays to trick human, humans and other organisms into believing they are having a perceptual experience that is different from reality. This experience is usually interactive and be and careful crafted, such as games exploring exotic worlds. The effectiveness of VR-based training process depends directly on the quality of the prepared training material or on the quality of the prepared virtual training environment. A detailed overview of the product documentation and the process of product assembly, installation maps, design drawings, 3D models, enable the definition of all the elements necessary for defining the, the training process. The method employed is based on a methodology for designing virtual reality applications after rigorous uh, evaluating sessions with people who had been involved in previous virtual reality projects and analysis of other methodologies mentioned inside the document as well. After deployed on the first projects, they made some correction and 
This methodology was further enacted. This work is based on four main steps. Figure 1. Assignment phase, analysis phase, creation phase, testing phase, phases of methodo methodology. Assignment phase. The fundamental elements that determine the impact that any education technology tool can make are informed and determined not only by cost or speed or accessibility, but also by its usability for a diverse and inclusive society. Therefore, in this phase, we check the many ideas of the overall concept of the virtual reality application we are going to develop. We must be able to describe the documents and purpose of our project. Basically, feedback was given on what we want to achieve with the release of the project. First all was to do a brainstorm to have different options on how to implement a project that meets the expectation but that mainly fits within the time that we had to be fulfilled. There were many complications about how the project will be carried out, as there were many ways to achieve. However, not all of them fit the tactics that we mentioned. Therefore, taking ide ideas from UABs, flight simulation clip simulators, it was decided to develop the simulator as a video game in which the user task is then manipulate the vehicle by making it go to an obst obstacle course. Thus, picking up the objectives being this one, the best option for the pull up process, do it's difficult and best train effectiveness. For convenience and better training, the simulator was designed to contain 10 levels, each one more difficult than the previous one. Each level was designed with the same purpose. The easier ones were designed to learn most basic movements of the vehicle, such as directing on a plane with simple obstacles, while the hard ones we can see an increase or difficult, like having alteration as slopes, holds, making it more difficult to drive because if it no longer has to face this challenge, will require process control of the vehicle to avoid falling over the edge and other obstacles. Analysis phase. In this section, we analyze what will be the necessary requirements for the creation of the simulator, the selection of actions and objects, and the size that will be placed in the final program. Process establish how methods are applied and software projects are managed. Method super technical description on how to perform different tasks of software engineer, such as design and building software. Tools include computer programs used for planning and implementing software, as well as other, other, other ways to support the process. In this phase of software development, the goals of software safety program are to eliminate, reduce, or control the possible hazards associated with potential software failures. Software security requirements may include national and international standards, customer requirements, or corporate needs. The first thing that had to be thrown about was to match the menu design. The menu shows the logo and the name of the simulator at the top, the name LUB SIM, LUB SIM, originated from the combination of the initials of the land or name vehicle with the world simulation. Since this is the representation of the simulator and means must achieve a positive impact using a simple and friendly interface in which we can make the adjust key things are necessary. In addition to having the option of selecting the level of the of his preference into the play menu. Regarding the structure of the simulator the main thing was to choose how two levels will be stru structured and which skills will be required in each of the proposed levels and how they will be distributed to achieve adequate training. 
The objective at each level is simple, to collect the flooring coins found along the map and then place the vehicle on a podium that will shine exclusively when the user has the coins fought at the each level. Levels were designed so that the user can first learn the basics such as the basic movements of the vehicle, as well as get the user to adapt to the controls so that with the passing of the levels and already with some adaptation, he can successfully conclude each of the challenges presented. Creation phase. The simulated environment can be like the real world to create a lifelike experience. For example, in simulation for pilot or combat training, or it can be different significantly from reality such as in VR games. Because of this, several factors must be considered when creating a virtual reality environment. The first thing was to think about how real the simulator should look to make more dynamic the way in which the user depots and aesthetics. It was decided to be more on real environment and look more like a futuristic video game. The development of the project was carried out in different phases and software, on which the phase was to develop the structure of the unnamed vehicle that will be used for the test in virtual reality. Vehicle model and its parts were made in SolidWorks because of this easy of use and later the assembly was made. Levels were made in SOLIDWORKS to both design walls and floor for each level with no material select to be assigned later in another software. Testing A software product should be only real after it was through a proper process of development, testing and book fi fixing. Testing looks at areas such as performance, stability and error handling by setting up test scenarios under control conditions and assessing the results. This is why exactly any software has to be tested. It is important to note that the software is mainly tested to see that it meets the customer need, needs and that conforms the standards. Conclusions once the steps were considered for this project were complete, the, the correspond, corresponding tests were performance and the results were analyzed, it was concluded that the main objective was partly fulfilled. This because the operation of the simulator was desired in each of these facets, which make it be a viable option for training since it takes several aspects to be taken into account in the development of a training software in a correct way. However, the test conducted not reflect the expected results because the main idea is to train a user who will pilot a real prototype and from trees analyze whatever the training that is carried out with virtual reality technology is effective in this area comparing the real training with the simulator this will be a scope for next paper. At this work, it's concluded that the simulator means all the aspects that were taken into account for the development of it, although there were details that could be improved, increasing the quality of the user experience, and the tests have been minimal due to external circumstances. The simulator meets the recommends and is estimated that it will be a viable op option if at some point a software of this type is required. Given that the tests are sufficiently demanding to improve the handling and it will be also required the most experienced pilots.
They are directors of this research event and auditorium participant. Our cordial greetings. Carmen Constanza Uribe and Luis Olivero Chaparro, we are teachers of the Systems Engineering Program at the University of Boyacá. The engineer Constanza is a Magister in Systems Engineering and a student of the doctoral program in Systems Engineering at the Autonomous University of Nuevo León, who has worked on the machine learning and model based on the bandits theory. The engineer Rich Chaparro is a system engineer with an advanced student PhD diploma in programming engineering and declarative languages. His current area of research is aimed at improving the automation of cases in BPM environment. environment. This research work is related to a proposal to optimize machine learning by reinforcement and improve the automatic management of cases in the field of BPM. Very well. The overview for this presentation is a brief motivation, introduction to the basic concepts, a mention of the most important related works, the proposed model with the results, the conclusion and future works, and finally the references. Motivation. An example of process with sequential and stage decision is educational training. Its purpose is to achieve some type of professionalization that ensures job and economic fulfillment. The result of this decision is not immediately only at the end of the process, the success level can be known. The processes that this proposal benefits are like this in sample. Introduction Some basic concepts are Cases and CMMN Graph Theory Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning and Bandits and multi arm Bandits Cases and CMMN a case example is medical healthcare, in which professionals and specialists have to make continuous decisions depending on the patient's condition, but they only perceive the result of the treatments and interventions at the end of the process. In a case unlike a deterministic process, it is not possible to fully know its activities and paths to solve it, but model and establish some dependencies between its activities is possible. Cases have been automated to give control of decisions to knowledge workers. However, some parts of these procedures can follow certain patterns that can be learned and automated with machine learning. Cases are modeled with the CMM notation, a graphical and declarative language formulated by the OMG, whose counterpart for deterministic processes is BPMN. This figure shows a case modeled with the CMN notation. The objective of this case is for one or more researchers to be able to write a scientific article with enough attributes to be published in a recognized journal. This case consists of two stages, preparing a draft and reviewing it. At the end of the first stage, the goal can be achieved, but if it is necessary to revise the draft, the goal will be researched reached after finishing the second stage. Note that the dotted lines indicate arbitrary choice at the discretion of the knowledge worker, doctor. Namely, it indicates decision uncertainty about these elements. This is the model that has been taken as a case study to apply the learning model based on multi arm advantage. Graphs. A graph is notated as a tuple containing one set of nodes and one set of edges, and in some cases a function is cited to explain the edges. Graphs are tools widely used to represent real situations and facilitate their mathematical resolutions. For this reason, there are multiple algorithms available for graphs. Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning In artificial intelligence, there are three types of machine learning. Supervised, when there, are, when there is training data. Not supervised, when the automaton itself finds common characteristics between the data and groups it together. And reinforced learning where the automaton learns from its success and failures by trial and error. The multi arm bandits belong to this last category. Bandit and multi arm bandit. This name comes from a casino game that is characterized because the player doesn't know what will happen when he executes an action, but his knowledge improves over the time and it is expected that after many times of playing the same action, he will have a clear idea of the expected re reward. 
The value of that reward is calculated with a simple average of the reward values received in each game, over the number of times that each action is played. This average is made for each of the possible actions. Related jobs. The initial literature review was classified as graph topics and reinforcement learning topics. Some of the many authors who have improved upon existing graph algorithms and others who have proposed new algorithms, as is done in this work, are presented in this slide. Similarly, regarding reinforcement learning, there is literature that proposes improvements to existing algorithms, and others that apply algorithms for solving problems such as the case in which by combining reinforcement learning with neural networks, it was possible to be the world champion of the Go game. Silver, 2017. Our proposal is made up of the stage graph, a probabilistic model that approximates the value function for each of the bandits, the exploration and exploitation aspects, the learning parameter and how it was defined, a pseudocode that represents the application, the test and the results, and the adaptation of the CMMN case model to the graph by stage. Proposed graph. The designed graph is a weighted connected directed tree. Its nodes are arranged in stages, as with the problem of choosing the educational institution at each level of schooling. Each node has been associated with a bandit for which the automaton tries to find its value function. With this probabilistic model, the probabilistic model associates the probability of following a route from stage 0 to L, pacing through nodes I1, I2, I3, etc. This probability is the multiplication of the state transition probabilities between each pair of these nodes and for each pair. It's calculated by dividing the exponential of the value function of a node M by the sum of the exponentials of all the nodes that can be accessed from a node N of the previous stage. Here the letter A corresponds to a 1 or a 0 of the agency matrix of the graph. The value function is magnitude of the preference that the automaton should have for each node and will influence the priority that the automaton will give the exploitation exp and exploration. Exploitation can be understood as the tendency of the automaton to stay testing the action that has given the best result to improve its approximation towards the real value associated with it. An exploration is understood as the possibility that the automaton goes out from time to time to look for other actions uh, different from the one that is giving the best result at the moment to avoid filing into local optimal values. Initially, the values of the value function for all nodes are zero, so in the formula, the same transition probability value will be obtained for all neighbor nodes of one node from the previous stage. At this moment, the automaton will be exploring and not exploiting. This situation will change over time. The exploration rate will go down and the exploitation rate will go up because the value function for each node is updated utilizing a delta parameter that is added or subtracted depending on if the path obtains reward or punishment at the ends of L stage. And towards the end of the execution stages, the value function for the preferred nodes should be approaching 1, in such a way that the probability that the other nodes are choosing decreases significantly. And so, the rate for exploitation is reduced and the rate of exploitation increases in search of improving the knowledge that it has about the value function of each node and the profit in general. Learning parameter. A learning parameter delta that controls the speed is defined, with which the value functions of the nodes involved in the road being tested are updated in each iteration. If this value is too small, the number of iterations is increased so that the automaton converges to the optimal path. If the value is too large, there is a risk that the automaton will keep the first solution that it has found or one among the first, and does not look further, thus leading to the misconception that the road is optimal, which is unlikely. In the septo code, the input parameters are the numbers of stages and the number of nodes in each stage, so that the total number of nodes in the graph can be calculated. And then, randomly generates an agency matrix and values for the bandits. 
This value follows a normal distribution with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. At each step, values for the state transition probabilities between the nodes involved in an iteration are updated. A new route is generated from node 0 considering these probabilities. The profit for that route is calculated, calculated and according to its sign, the value function of the nodes involved is updated. With these values, transition probabilities will be recalculated for the next step. Experimental results. To validate this code, the five stage graph seen in the figure was fixed. This simple graph was set up to easily establish the behavior of the application by varying the number of iterations and the learning parameter. Indeed, the algorithm works. For most experiments, the average of the approximate gains, the cyan color curve, converges to the actual value shown on the blue curve. The red curve records the value of the gain that the automaton finds in each iteration. The convergence in this figure is relatively fast since only 100 iterations were made. Although it has not reached the real value of the gain, it found the path of nodes that have the best final gain. With the above, we proceed to analyze the learning parameter to find the most appropriate one. Some of the results of the experiments carried out with Delta can be seen in this table, where the difference between the obtained gain and the actual gain has been normalized. Since its values do not get close to the actual total gain, tests with a non-fixed Delta value are performed. Now Delta depends on the magnitudes and sign of the gain and of the gamma value. This value must be very small to obtain a Delta value less than 1. As delta will already have the sign of the profit associated, it will be enough to add it to the value function as shown in the formula. Tests were carried out with this parameter to establish its ideal value and an appropriate number of iterations. In this table, you can see how gamma values are around 10 to the negative fire power. The results obtained for the normalized difference of the gains were much lower than the when delta had a fixed value with numbers of iteration between 100 to 1000. In this histogram, you can see how for most of the iterations, the normalized difference of the gains was close to zero. Random graph. The algorithm was also tested with randomly generated graphs, but with a fixed number of stages and nodes by stages. This figure shows a graph with nine stages. For this graph, we could see the necessity to reduce the magnitude of the gamma learning factor, since as the number of stages increases, the magnitude of the calculated gain increases, and a value less than 1 must be kept for the learning factor delta. This figure shows the convergence of the approximate value of the gain towards the real maximum in less than 10,000 iterations for the random graph. Adapted CMMN model Adapting the model of a case in CMMN to the graph in a stage is not easy because there is a lot of uncertainty and reflecting in the dotted lines, as you can see in the graph. It was necessary to replicate some activities nodes in several stages because it is not known when it will be decided to select one of those actions. It was also necessary to add a new activity in each stage because if no activity may be required for each defining stage. This figure shows the first part of the stage graph obtained from the CMMN model for writing a scientific paper because it is made up of two stage or sub processes. The result graph meets the characteristics of the probabilistic graph designing, designed in the first part of this investigation. Also for the second part of the CMMN model, the same previous conditions apply. Conclusions and future work. The models, both the probabilistic model and the CMMN model, are completely original from the others and reflect a possibility of learning automation and improving the automation of cases. The multi armed banded models are efficient and have been implemented for various problems, with low computational cost thanks to the handling of an adequate percentage of probability for exploration and exploitation. The probability model that was used 
generates adequate results to find the optimal route of actions. The presented application promises to support the improvement of automation of cases. However, it is necessary to expand the current work in order to reduce uncertainty of a dynamic process or case of a business in general. Finally, it is advisable to compare the performance of this algorithm with other algorithms and test it in other scenarios. These are the references used in this work. Thanks for your attention. Here are the emails of the authors. Good day. In the second EAI International Conference of, on Smart Technology, I'm pleased to present the paper Parking Slots, the Last Mile Literature Review, co-authored by Blanca Italia Perez Perez and Giovanni Lizarraga Lizarraga. Introduction. Uh, in this study, uh, an investiga investigation was made of what has been applied to the problem of the so-called last mile. The delivery of the last mile is considered one of the most expensive and least efficient sections of the supply chain. The logistics that occur in a city are a major problem for urban centers affected by the road and consolidation of economic and industrial tasks with traditional and human activities. The last majority of studies follow the traditional transport approach with the aim of explaining variables related to transport supply instead analyzing real demand. In 2017, uh, the challenges that real logistic and cargo transportation have faced are increasingly complicated due to the transition in the economic structure, the design of cities, urbanization, the transportation system, and the external situation proper of our logistical activities in urban areas. Uh, urban logistics centered in three elements, vehicles and flow of goods characteristics of the goods and focus of the investigation. Within the first element, vehicles and flows of goods can be analyzed independently or jointly. The 28% of the total transportation costs of a product are attributed to the final section of the supply network. Attention to the last my problem leans or trend towards the best allocation of resources so the level of service is maximized and costs are minimal in the final segment of transport. Uh, in the last mile problem, designing the, the, the last mile system efficiently is very important to serve customers and, uh, efficiently and economically. The, the comment that uh, the changes that logistic and cargo transportation have faked are increasing complicated due to transitions in the economic structure, city design, urbanization, the transportation system, and the external situation typical to typical of the logistic activities in urban areas. Despite the fact that logistic is an important generator of employment, the negative aspects that are these in cargo transportation have increased uh, this situation are 
pollution, congestion, and inefficient use of resources. Uh, those inefficiencies uh, can cancel your long-term benefits. Attention to the last mile problem leans or tends towards uh, the best allocation of resources so that the level of services maximized and costs are minimal in the final segment of transportation. Double packing is a bad practice that is common used by drivers to save time in search of available bait and unload their products to the delivery's client. However, this leads factors like road congestion, noise, insecurity, and air pollution for over other vehicles blocked uh, by leads uh, transportations by the transportations in the question in the question to increase. Uh, non non the least if the availability of this space is insufficient, drivers park in prohibited zones in an attempt to improve their productivity. In this picture, uh, we can observe that these vehicles are parking on the yellow line. The vehicle in front uh, is unloading cakes for a party business. Uh, this is because there are no there are no parking slots available. Theoretical framework. Urbanization generates big uh, po population population that grows constantly bringing forward mobility, pollution, and residue uh, management problem. There are new information and communication technologies that unite uh, to form solutions for, for smart cities. Some concepts will now be men mentioned. mentioned. Uh, the last mile. Uh, the deliver of the last mile is considered one of the most expensive and at the same time, least efficient sections of the supply chain. Designing the last mile system efficiently is very important to, to serve customers uh, uh, effic efficiently and economically. The smart cities uh, is a concept of utmost importance uh, for the scientific community. Since planning the transformation, uh, trans transformation of cities, of uh, sustainable types is uh, a tax of vital importance in, in the developed develop cities. The architecture of smart cities uh, can be structured in four layers, application, middleware, network, and detection. The evolution of low carbon energy system is a vital part of uh, achieving sustainable Double development where transport is an extremely important link for long term carbon reduction. BRP. A BRP or vehicle routing problem is a, is a variant of the extend, extensively integrated, integrated traveling salesman problem. The feature or fluctuating travel duration enables to bear BRP to account for current conditions such as urban congestion, where the traveling speed is not consultant due to variation in traffic density. It is considered an algorithm as a stochastic process where the number of places is random variable, which is also a function of travel time with the variables to be defined. A free slot algorithm forecast design. There are many factors to consider in order to find parking slots in cities. It is subject to a low percentage of variability, which depends on local regulations, subject to a, a slow rate of variability. And uh, this variability is due 
to local regulations. Other conditions that need to be considered are important events, day of week, normal holiday, weather conditions, time of year, and unexpected situation like floods, the number of vehicle variates. And as consequence, the, there is a random distribution in free parking spaces. Uh, I mean, uh, the av availability of parking slots. Okay. Uh, some factors that we can consider uh, to classify different patterns are uh, working days, versus weekends, um, Saturdays and Sundays on holidays, uh, days with adverse weather, rain, wine, uh, wind, excuse me, and uh, data mining tool for analysis or historical data. Um, and uh, for example, in, in this uh, graph, we can uh, check uh, the x-axis, uh, we have fraction of the day in minutes, and in the way axis, we, we can find available parking spots, and this is the behavior. Okay. Uh, the ACO or ant colony optimization helps uh, build an, an effective and efficient delivery route. This algorithm simulates the, the feeding behavior to the ant colony by releasing uh, pheromones in its pathways, which can provide heuristic information for, for other ants. Hormone density increases if more ants uh, walk the same path, uh, building the best path to the food source. Ah, now, the attended home delivered, in the attended uh, uh, home delivered, uh, the customers have, have to be at home during a uh, pre-arranged pre to time period, period and delivers have to to be achieved with mm, that time period. This mode is required under some circumstances. Uh, for example, the purchased goods has to be examined due to this high value or needs to be uh, signed for delivery confirmation. However, such a delivery mode lacks flexibility. Uh, the custom customers may not be available when the delivery arrives due to some emergency or delivers could not arrive due to the traffic issue. If that case, uh, the courier may have to conduct a second deliver, delivery, uh, which has a low efficient and is time consuming. Now, uh, the share reception box, when the courier delivers the purchased goods uh, to share reception box, uh, can automatically uh, automatically uh, send a text message to the corresponding customer, which contain one uh, uh, of code of opening a corresponding corresponding box. After that, the corresponding customer can pick up the goods from SRB, and they are available time. Uh, the application of SRB can, uh, can release uh, the time constraints for both customer and couriers, obviously. Um, moreover, the application of SRB can protect customers' privacy instead of using home address uh, when purchased online. Uh, customers can uh, the SRB as the cons consignment address. More and more e-commerce enterprises deploy SRB in large cities uh, so as facility their business. And now the figure uh, number seven shows a map with the location of uh, the 20 clients uh, to visit uh, in light 
the light blue diamonds. Uh, in the center is the warehouse of starting point. It is a, a red square of the delivery vehicle. Green triangles uh, represent the saving zone. The colored dates are uh, the seven routes that the method throws. The optimal solution purchased with a, 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 a HD delivery most mode consists of seven routes due to the limitation of vehicle capacity and customer the, the window. Conclusions. Freight parking is a serious problem in a big cities. As cities grow, the merchandise transportation problem is faced with them. So finding effective methodologies that help us increase the number of available slots for merchandise delivery in the last mile of almost utmost importance and just like that uh, we could contribute to reduction of of the time a driver looks for a lot with it we contribute to reduction of gasoline expenses noise and traffic currently we have to solve a last mile problem uh, in the central area of San Nicolás de los Garza, Nuevo León, Mexico, uh, where various business converge along with a central plaza. Uh, the problem is deliveries are made by suppliers at the same time who struggle to find a place where they can park uh, their delivered vehicles. Deliver vehicles usually waste time to looking for a parking slot or worse they will park it in prohibited places or in places that block the streets this review is uh, beginning to put forward uh, a solution to the situation uh, we hope to have uh, the results approximately in a year and a half uh, these are some references and uh, thank you for your time. Hello everyone, my name is Arturo Torres. I'm a PhD student of the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León in Mexico, and today I'm going to present my research called Cyber Threat Intelligence Methodologies, Hunting Cyber Threats with Threat Intelligence Platforms and Deception Techniques. And the main reason of this research is the fact that Cyber Threat Intelligence is one of my main skills in the professional field, as well as the multiple cybersecurity incidents and the considerable increase is ever crime and cyber threats that we have witnessed in the last years. For example, in 2019, more than 4 billion emails accounts were created with an approx of 1 million emails sent and received every second during that year. And that is expected that by 2024, the number will reach for more than 5 billion emails created accounts. And following this example of email, according to internal light stats, Almost 3 million emails uh, were sent per second in 2020, and 67% of those emails were classified as spam with malicious content. This tells us that digital systems are being pressured by cyber attacks, and not only in quantity, but also in the complexity of the techniques used by cyber attacks uh, or cyber uh, uh, threat actors. Uh, using techniques like phishing or business email compromise to be able to violate digital systems or steal corporate information, according to Interpol. 
And this is because the high dependency of, on technology, as well the large amount of critical and confidential information handled by organizations today, that have be, become target of cyber criminals who have developed new ways to affect integrity, availability, and confidentiality of the organizations and system data. Using advanced techniques such as digital hijacking, better known as ransomware, which recorded an approximate loss and damage of more than 10 billion euros in 2019, according to a recently research published by the European Union Agency of Cybersecurity. In that same research, some of the cases with the greatest impact are globally detailed since 2018. Ransomware was used to target a state organization as a tool to make money. Also, there are another cases uh, documented uh, that have been caused more impact than only uh, loss of data, reputation, or money for the organizations too. Also, the World Economic Forum published in this Global Risk Report in 2020, which are the risks to consider in the coming years, measuring them in the probability of occurrence and impact, in which we can see cyber attacks as one of the highest probability and impact only below threats such as natural disasters and even infection diseases. However, the main problem that organization faces is the advanced cyber threats are by pacing the traditional protection controls deployed in the organizations, such as firewalls, antivirus, which are commonly based on detection engines for static signatures or only known threats. Therefore, cybersecurity specialists have been choosing to develop new ways to prepare and generate new strategies against disadvantaged threats using collaborative intelligence platforms to prevent or minimize the risk of, of a cyber attack before it happens. This process is known as cyber threat intelligence, which is defined according to Gartner as a knowledge based on evidence, which include context, mechanism, indicators, implication and, practic and practical advice about an existing or emergency threat. Given this, the IT cybersecurity community has chosen to use intelligence techniques to prepare for major cyber threats. Therefore, the field of cyber threat intelligence has grown significantly in the last years, given the growth and evolution of cyber threats, as well the complexity of the techniques used by adversaries. The main contribution of this research is based on the compilation and research of the most used schemes, tools, challenges, and set of methodologies for execution of a cyber threat intelligence pro program, as well as the deployment of cyber threat intelligence platform based on deception techniques for data collection and cyber threat uh, event detection. This will allow organizations with smart budget to use a cyber threat intelligence platforms and methodologies described in this research to secure their information and prevent further intrusions. The cyber threat intelligence field has been widely accepted by different cybersecurity specialists from different sectors of the industry, such the energy sector, which has been subject to different types of advanced threats in the last years. On the other hand, Verizon confirmed more than 900 cyber attacks and about 2,107 cases of disclosure of confirmed authentication data in the financial sector. As well, the integration of digital system, Internet of Things, cloud computing, uh, smart system, and other, and other industries have been adopting the cyber threat intelligence methodologies. However, one of the main points that we need to understand in this area is the difference between data, information, and intelligence to understand cyber threat intelligence. These three terms are something used uh, carsley according to Dr. Christopher Alberg, who explained uh, all the difference between all Three, uh, three terms in his book, uh, The Threat Intelligence Handbook. Uh, organization often embeds uh, threats data sources into their network and only find that they cannot process all the additional data, which only adds the burden on the analyst trying to classify the threats. Rather, threat intelligence lightens that burden by helping analysts to decide what, pro what to prioritize and what to ignore. So a different context of that terms, data, information, and intelligence can given when we talk about cybersecurity. Therefore, we can say cyber threat intelligence is the ability to acquire knowledge about a company, as well as the existing condition and capabilities in order to determine to the possible action of a malicious actors or threat when exploiting existing critical vulnerabilities of that organization. 
One of the main challenges in executing a cyber threat intelligence strategy focus on the quality of intelligence obtained through a data analyst and uh, and how it can be able to transform all this large amount of information in something actionable that can be used to make decisions for top management. However, the commercialization of products and services related to cyber threat intelligence from different developers and vendors have helped to automate many of these tasks related to extraction, detection, update, update of threats, and especially the automation uh, of how they can respond to that incident on specific cyber threats. And this is because with knowledge of the adversary tactics and objectives, defenders uh, have the possibility to prepare their infrastructure to counter attacks in the wildest range possible to, co to cover all possible adversaries' attack vectors. However, there is some research that mentioned that there is a great challenge in the cyber threat intelligence fields. Since it's mentioned, the cyber threat intelligence lack a mature methodology, which can affect the analyst of uh, or the analysis of uh, threats and adversary by defenders. Despite it is challenged, cyber threat intelligence not be ruled out yet, since it is an emerging field that has a lot of potential and constant development by the cybersecurity analyst community, with the objective of applying defensive strategies and controls against adversaries who seek engage an organization. There are different frameworks and methodology uses for driving threat intelligence today, in which we will focus on the foremost used in the last years by the industry and the cybersecurity community. The cyber kill chain model uh, it's, uh, was developed by Lockett and Martin and is based on the military concept of kill chain, which consists of seven different phases that allow us to understand in which part of the process or part of the attack chain a specific threat occurs. Therefore, if we understand where that threat is in the process, we can focus our resources and efforts on mitigating it. And if we have a proper framework, we can understand what action needs to be taken in that area so that we can prepare and respond quickly to the opponent's techniques. By the other hand, the diamond model for intrusion analysis describes the main capabilities and characteristics of an intrusion event as adversary, capabilities, infrastructure, and victim which are linked in a diamond-shaped diagram in which the edge are used to represent the relationships between characteristics uh, that can be exploited analytic to discover and further develop knowledge of malicious activity. That is, the model describes an adversary deploys a, capa a capacity on some infrastructure against a victim. These activities, in turn, are known as an event which are defined as a series of steps that adversary must to execute to achieve his objective. Like, likewise, the authors of the model describe seven fundamental bases to understand the intrusion model process in the form of actions, where the objectives are and needs of the adversaries are defined in order to meet their objectives. While the kill chain model provides information on attacker's operation, the diamond model broadens the perspective and context of the attackers between each, between each of the intrusion phases. That is, it together allows to have broader view of the attacker and, on, and not only just the technical indicators. MITRE is a non-profit organization that works in the public interest in federal, state, and local government, as well in the industry and academia, and also they develop a methodology called ATT&CK. This model originated from the project uh, that I met to document and categorize post-engagement adversary tactics, techniques and procedures against like Microsoft Windows system to improve detection of malicious behavior. Since then, it has grown to include uh, other operating system as well as other areas such as mobile devices, cloud based systems and industrial culture system. ATT&CK is used uh, is used as a basis of development for specific threat models in the private sectors, in the government, and the in community of cybersecurity products and services that contains no behaviors of attacker or adversary, better known as advanced persistent th threats. Attack fo focus on how external adversaries engage and operate with computer information networks, mapping all the phases, uh, tactic, techniques, and procedure uh, do you use it by attackers. Based on the last methodology, based on the attack methodology, uh, there's a new methodology called Mitre Shield, 
uh, which is based on the implementation of the concept of active cyber defense, which aims to carry out cyber defense uh, actions until it's possible to deceive the adversary, having an active participation with him to study and learn more about the tactics and techniques used to generate a cyber threat intelligence and prepare for the threats. With the shield, there, there's uh, also a matrix of tactics uh, that denotes what the defender is trying to achieve through columns and techniques, which describes how a defense uh, achieves the tactics. However, those terms have been made to fit the domain of active cyber defense. These tactics within Mitro Shield must be taken in, into account as a strategy of every planet active defense operation in order to respond to an intrusion from an adversary or threat. Given this, it is necessary to develop the techniques and uh, describe it in the shield to implement security controls in an operational environment. Mitre found that single technique can be compatible with several different tactics. And for any one tactic, there are multiple techniques that can be used. In addition, it has a section where attack tactics and techniques are mapped so defenders can have applicable active defense information, including the present opportunity space, the active defense techniques uh, that will be implemented, and the use case for that implementation too. The experimentation and uh, and this research uh, was to deploy a vulnerable system in the public cloud of Amazon Web Services with the main objective of exposing vulnerable service of the platform to internet in order to be able to collect real threats and mostly automated, uh, automatically uh, operation in cyberspace, which will allow to use to collect some of the adversaries tactic Technica procedures and will allow us to analyze the information to every single model or methodology uh, described in, in this uh, research through cases studies with the, with the purpose of being able to identify how which the models are implemented uh, in the events of the cyber attack uh, and how they complement each other too. The following uh, is the results uh, and data uh, and intrusion attempts collected by the platform deployed after 20 days on Amazon Web Services. Uh, and this will help us to analyze all the data collected by the honeypots exposed uh, to the internet to analyze the cyber kill chain model, attack, shield, and diamond model in order to understand some of the phases and TTPs carried out by the adversaries to achieve their objectives with the the case study that arise involves the victim uh, who deploys a service with uh, SSH access exposed to internet. The adversaries use uh, mass scanning techniques to detect known vulnerabilities in the exposed system. Additionally, uh, the adversaries perform email accounts using techniques such as uh, social engineering and phishing based on previous UIP uh, scans to decide the language to use. Additionally, adversaries generate a, an exploit to run a web shell as a malware form uh, from a previously infected website. And there have been detected different attempts to access the platform by protocols such as SSH, RDP, from different IPs classified as a malicious, where, uh, malicious IP, IP address or malicious behavior. Some of these IPs managed to access uh, the system through the use of techniques like brute force attack and dictionary attacks too. Once the adversary entered the systems, command execution uh, were detected to download files through a shellcode to a URL classified as malicious by malware content. After downloading uh, command execution were detected for downloading malware files from malicious IPs. Once the malicious IPs were detected and the malware downloaded by the adversary, we proceed to review open intelligence source such as VirusTotal or Alimbaut OTX to search for IP address or domains related to the installed malware. The result of the investigation were car carried out with the methodology described in the document that are presented below. So uh, all the the case study on all the information that we detected, we made we we uh, try to map, map it uh, on the different methodologies. And for cyber kill chain model, 
help us to understand each of the phases of the attack chain carried out by the adversaries and gate us to be able to start uh, uh, more deeply research for the relevant events in each other the phases. As you can see, all the case study that I described before is uh, documented on the cyber kill chain process and may be for every on the every every single stage of the process. With, uh, with information collected by the Honeypit platform and mapping all that information with server kill chain model, it can be possible to go more deeply uh, and have more information into the tactics and techniques used by the adversaries to understand their objectives and the operation through use a mirror attack, mirror attack uh, matrix. And we, ma we map it out all the information and all the relevant tactics and techniques, and this is the result of the activities that, that we detected in our experiment. Once TTPs of the adversaries are, uh, are modeled and mapped in, in the attack framework, we can use Miter Shield to take a, a map of the TTPs found on, on the attack, on um, the attack framework used by the adversaries to carry out an active defense strategy. For example, initial access uh, to expose the system was done through a remote ex uh, remote exposed system through a valid account. Given this, Shield gives us the possibility of editing an active defense strategy with the opportunity to validate if the adversary already has credential from one or more accounts valid from any network system by using a decoy or honeypot to collect more information on the TTPs used by the adversary, as we have been doing during this investigation. For the diamond model results, uh, at the diamond model, we use a victim-centered approach uh, that is uh, the, used our center of research uh, on the honeypot or the system that was, uh, was breached in order to reveal the connection and the context between the adversaries related elements such as infrastructure and, capabil and capabilities organization organizing in events so all these uh, all these four methodologies and frameworks help us to understand the technical indicators uh, the tactics the procedures and how we can understand the context objectives and map it out on on the diamond model uh, and know all the, the phases, the methodology is the infrastructure, the capability of the adversary, and try to and try to understand what happened to uh, with all that information when we correlate all the information in this uh, in this particular framework. So our conclusions is that uh, if we understand how the attacks can, uh, we can benefit the cybersecurity team in organization, can be benefit the cybersecurity community by encouraging defenders to collect data on adversaries to increase the knowledge base of TTPs, facilitating the selection of defense measures. If defenders implement countermeasures faster than their opponents evolves, they maintain a tactic, tactical advantage. advantage. Hello everyone, my name is Arturo Torres. I'm a PhD student of the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León in Mexico. And today I'm gonna present my research called Data Driven Cyber Threat Intelligence as a very Mexican territory. And one of the main reasons of this research is the fact that cyber threat intelligence is one of my main skills in the professional field, as well as the multiple cybersecurity incidents and the considerable increase in cyber crime and cyber threats that we have witnessed in the last years in Mexico. As you know, 
Cybersecurity is a topic that appears more frequently in our media every day. Cyber attacks or cyber threats that we face every day with increasing frequency can affect the integrity of crit critical infrastructure, such as the country banking systems. The incidence of personal identity thefts and other crimes and even contribute the increasingly tenuous credibility of data and general information that compromise our ability to objectively discern at the times that we make important decisions in organizations. With the constant use and dependence of technology thanks to innovation and digital transformation, such Internet of Things or cloud computing, it has become very important to have protection measures for our assets or digital information against cyber threats or cyber crime actors. In fact, cybersecurity venture predicts that cyber crime will cost around 6 billion annually by the end of 2021, making it more profitable than global trade in all major companies and illegal drugs. Likewise, Force magazine published that a research uh, from cybersecurity company F-Secure that had been detected uh, an increase of more than 300% attacks on IoT devices in the first half of 2019. Well, in September 2019, this device were used to bring down web services such as Wikipedia through a DDoS attack, the Nello service attack, and it is estimated that there will be an increase in the use of IoT devices as intermediaries between attackers and their victims. Also, the World Economic Forum in the annual risk report in 2020 uh, classifies cyber attacks uh, as one of the most probable and most impact risk uh, for the further years, uh, only below uh, by other risks such natural disasters, uh, lack of water, extreme weather conditions, and all that other risk. Therefore, cybersecurity specialists have been choosing to develop new ways to prepare and generate new strategies against these advanced threats using collaborative intelligence platforms to prevent or minimize the risk of, uh, of cyber attack before it happens. Our main contribution aims to present the, a research of the current state of cybersecurity in Mexico in order to obtain an overview and compilation and investigation of cyber threat intelligence schemes, methods, and data sets corresponding to the Mexican territory available in, to analyze in further investigations. In Mexico, we have witnessed multiverse cybersecurity events in the last years. In fact, McKinsey and company, in conclusion with the Mexican government, issue a document called Perspectiva de Seguridad in Mexico, in which they mentioned that cyber queen in Mexico affects more than 33 million Mexicans per year, and the financial loss of cyber crime in Mexico reached a figure more than $7.7 .7 billion only in 2017. The exponential increase of movement in cyberspace has led to correlated escalation in the criminal activity in Mexico, in particular with regards to illegal hacking, identity theft, credit card fraud, and online exploitation of minors. Therefore, cybersecurity specialists have chosen to develop new ways to prepare and generate, generate new strategies against these advanced threats using collaborative intelligence platforms to prevent or minimize the risk of cyber attacks before it happens in the country. This practice is known as cyber threat intelligence, which is defined according to Gartner as evidence-based knowledge, which includes context mechanism indicators, implicators, and practical advice about an existing or emerging threat that uh, want to danger any asset or organizations. By the other hand, SANS defines cyber threat intelligence as analyzing information about capabilities, opportunities, and intentions of adversaries that meet the specific requirements determined by interested party. The cyber threat intelligence cycle is a process to generate accurate and actionable information for organization to face a specific or emerging threat. And the role of cyber threat intelligence really comes down to a few things. 
uh, like for example, uh, help existing staff to be more effective, uh, allows to use automate uh, time computing manual task, and it also saves times by allowing to aggregate data from those multiple sources to make uh, alerts uh, and, and send it to the cyber threat intelligence analyst. And then provide executives uh, with accurate data on where to spend time, where to spend money and resource, and relevant and accurate uh, intelligence enable a shift from being reactive to proactive. And that again becomes much more agile and provides more competitive advantage for the organizations. So as, as an example, how intelligence really adds value to uh, organization. Basically, it, it will give you uh, visibility and allow, allow the threat intelligent analyst, as I mentioned uh, before, to add value very quickly, timely information, actionable information that can be feeding uh, defense teams through the various roles in the security operations center, etc. So an example, uh, the, I, the analysts will identify uh, the main threats facing the organization and from there that will the, all the information on all the feeds, the research with the main objective of being able to map the existing organizational weakness to develop uh, a cyber threat or cyber security defense that again, as I mentioned before, can deter and mitigate uh, that, that specific threat. We basically want to defend ourselves against uh, against it if we have before uh, all the information before the threat can reach our network or organization. In this research, the main contribution is to show some of the platforms that provide information about cyber threats that can occur in Mexico and that can be used to gather or generate uh, relevant and actionable information for a Mexican organization that is uh, using information collected as a starting point of any malware train or campaign or cyber threat that has occurred or that uh, has uh, targeting Mexico. Categorizing the, in, in different sections like phishing, firewall, IPS events, honeypons events, uh, vulnerabilities or social network data. So that organizations can carry out uh, an investigation or research to understand the cyber threat actor or the objective of the th specific threat, the techniques and procedures to measure the uh, impacts on the business with the main objective of taking all that information and converting this information to a cyber security strategy to reduce the risk of any incident uh, for the organization. One of the, 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 the source data that uh, we found during this uh, research is uh, by one of the most important vendors in the region. Uh, Fortinet Threat Intelligence Insider uh, in Latin America had a quarterly threat trend tool by Fortinet Labs that maps information for 10 countries in uh, Latin America region. And one of them include Mexico which has data collected and analyzed from millions of daily cybersecurity events detected by sensors deployed in the region and in the country. And also offers uh, data on cyber threats trends by country and information on the 10 main cyber attacks for the countries of the region in the category of malware, exploits and botnets, as well as the regional executive summaries of the main area of the risk and vulnerability, vulnerabilities identified, as well as the security tips and key fin findings, in addition of the possibility to download all this information in a PDF format, which is updated quarterly in the three main languages of the region, that uh, is English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Another city cyber threat intelligence source uh, that offers information of vulnerabilities and visibilities of devices exposed uh, to the internet in the Mexican sector is Shodan, that is a search engine uh, that gives information uh, when a device is directly connected to the internet, uh, even if it's a small desktop computer to a uh, nuclear power plants or big organizations. 
Shulant has uh, great information because consults uh, to obtain public information related to a country, to organization, or specific or specific application uh, public on the internet, and have uh, um, uh, these uh, services free uh, on the internet. Uh, Shodan recently added panels uh, and exposition of the internet availability for census countries, including one for Mexico, which shows the number of industrial control systems exposed in, in the country, as well as the most relevant vulnerabilities uh, ports open and uh, all, the, all the information related to the cybersecurity state and the vulnerabilities in the country too. On the other hand, uh, there are various platforms made up of a network of honeypots, which uh, are nothing more than devices exposed to the internet that works as uh, decoys to attract cyber uh, threats and monitor the techniques used by this uh, cyber threats or cyber threat actors, such uh, bad packets, uh, cyber threat intelligence services, which has a global network of honeypots that detects the activities of botnets uh, which are scanning the internet uh, or participating in malicious activities. Malicious activities. Also, this specific service has a lot of honeypots deployed in Mexico, which can provide you information on cyber threats that target our country, in which safe tools uh, has been used for different studies or research to monitor botnet campaigns, uh, botnet traffic, uh, botnet scanning, uh, for scanning devices exposed to the internet and the profiling of critical industrial system exposing to the on the web too. Another platform uh, from which uh, phishing information can be downloaded is OpenFish, uh, which offer uh, different plans for the use uh, for this platform uh, and allows you to download URL uh, malicious URL for free to the, with detailed information on each site. It should be noted that using free phishing site uh, download by the platform, uh, you uh, download, uh, you can have certain information, but we uh, we found a lot of uh, URL, URLs with uh, the MX domain, and we found a lot of information of, of uh, that is constantly updated in this, in this specific uh, website. So it can be used to, for for uh, added to the IOC's uh, strategy from the devices of the organizations. Another tool that uh, can provide intelligence on malicious sites uh, for Mexico is URL House, which offer feeds of malicious sites that can be downloaded uh, for Mexico. So in this particular uh, in this particular specific uh, action on this uh, URL House, we downloaded all the information related to to Mexico, and we found more than 2,000 uh, URLs that were found or classified as phishing or, or have malicious content on this. As you know, uh, this uh, research uh, complement uh, all the most relevant information as well the current situation in Mexico using, uh, for the most part, documented issue by the Mexican government and this attracts uh, a lot of information and attention since there's various uh, research initiatives and strategies under development in the country. Given this, we were we able to find different intelligence sources related to information for Mexico, which will be analyzed uh, in, future, in future work and dictate the ability to generate a threat detection model based on the evidence collected from the sources described in this uh, research. It also clear uh, that uh, there's a numerous positive trends in the community, such as more organizations producing intelligence rather than just consuming it. This uh, will be help all the industry and all the Mexican territory to gather more information and add it to the specific cybersecurity strategies uh, based on all the data and all the information that uh, is happening in the country and is gathering and processed by uh, all the other sources that we present in this research.
Hi, my name is Nestor Lopez. I'm from the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León. I made this research with Aida Gonzalez, and I want to talk about this paper with the title of Technologies in Education for Visually Impaired People, a Literature Review. The, the abstract, the advancement of technology allows better assistive tools to be developed for people with visual impairments. In this paper, a, lit a literature review is presented on the technologies that are used to support the education of people with visual impairments and describe about the seriousness and the impact of inclusive education, which indicates equality among the students regardless of the challenges they may have. The main technologies used are screen readers which allow the screen to, or the device to be used to be read with audio and the screen magnifiers which enlarge the text to make it easier to be read by the user with whistle impairment. Both technologies allow access to the mass media which help their education and finally it is intended to obtain the main characteristics that these technologies must have for the future development of a new educational tool for visually impaired people. Okay. The International Classification of Functioning and Disability and Health defines disability as all impairments, activity limitation and participation restriction. Disability is interaction between individuals with a health condition and, and environment factors. Visual impairment is defined as a condition that directly involves the functioning of the eye and it comes from moderate difficulty in perceiving lights to total blindness. Therefore, the scope of information perceived by a person from the environment is, lim is limited, so this significantly compromises the physical integrity of those who suffer. According to the World Health Organization in 2010, there were almost 40 million people with visual disabilities in the world, which 80% of them are in working age. Unfortunately, people with visual disabilities face challenge to reach the labor market. For example, some schools are not sufficiently adapted so people with visual impairments cannot finish their, their studies. Also, this population has problems with inaccessible public transport and urban mobility. The inclusion of people with disabilities in the use of technologies can have a great impact for them since technologies can be developed or adapted according to the needs and characteristics of each user. Inclusive education refers to vulnerable groups that is, giving equality and providing the same type of educational services as non-vulnerable students. Therefore, it implies that education institutions require infrastructure, internet tools and different types of support as well as that teachers have adequate equipment and training to teach quality teaching in order to achieve a greater inclusion. In this work, we will search for technologies and tools developed for visually impaired people for their inclusion in education and later we will describe the most important one of the most important characteristics of these technologies for the development of more accessible technologies for visually impaired people in our methodology an international bibliographic review of the articles published in the databases was carried out through the National Consortium of Scientific and Technologi Technological Information Resources, applying a time limit of five years from 2015 to 2020. We also searched in Google Scholar applying the same time limit. The keywords used were discapacidad, visual, educación, tecnologías, inclusión, accessibility in Spanish and disability visual accessibility technologies inclusive and education in English 
The following compositions were made with all impairment, inclusive education, accessible education, teaching methods, and visual impairment technology. The main two filters were that first, we collect uh, documents that talk about developed technologies to support teaching methods for people with visual impairments. And we only select a, the research purpose whose focus were aimed to people with total blindness. Here are some results. First, uh, the screen reader is an adaptive technology which is currently a, a main resource that allows people to access information and perform reading and writing tasks. This tool helps a student with visual impairment to have an autonomy with reading a book, searching for information, downloading music, printing documents, writing letters, correcting errors with the spoken program, having email, among other activities. Most common screen readers such as non-visual desktop access, NVDA, and job access with the speech or JAWS are frequently used by interactive learning systems for visual impaired people. Barros et al. developed a Java application where the main objective is to teach students with visual impairments the application is an audible multiple option questionnaire and the users use the numpad from the keyboard to answer the question. They use the numpad because the, the key 5 has a braille ubication uh, in the keyboard. So this helps the students to, to make it uh, more easier for them. Matusek et al. developed a web-based system to facilitate access to educational materials by, by reading. The system enables teachers to prepare and process arbitrary topics focusing on technological documents that contain mathematics and physics formulas. The system converts the content automatically to speech and it was e evaluated by 40 41 students with visual impairments and 3 teachers. They had positive results, especially for, a for the difficult topics. Vera et al. developed a system that helps blind people to learn the their environment and be able to navigate indoors and or outdoors scenarios. The system can, can identify obstacles in the real-life scenario, which is very helpful, and it's low, low cost resolution for visually impaired people. The study also found that it can be used in the rehabilitation of people that recently became blind. Lutfon et al. developed a low cost system that to learn math braille using Emmet braille uh, and calculating numbers called it Institutor, which provides a voice and vibrational feedbacks to assist the users. It was developed mainly in, in Java and it was evaluated by teachers and experts and students provided good resolution in these students in, in Bangladesh. It also had a, a great result in, in usability test. Better Jay proposed well, a web-based music environment for blind people. This tool is developed in JavaScript and runs on the standard browsers. This web application is text-based and centered to around input field, which serves as main interaction element. All the elements are accessible to a screen reader. Cecily Morrison et al. Present, presented Torino, a tangible programming language for teaching programming concepts to children regardless of the level of vision. A tangible program programming language uses physical objects to represent or interact with programming constructs. This makes a great way to teach programming concepts to visual impaired people. This tool was, was designed using an inclusive design. This means that it's not only for a specific type of users, 
It can be easily used by users with, with or without disabilities. Ferrant et al. develop an embed device capable, capable of guiding people using specialized virtual sound source. With this device, they can be able to guide people to do sports like running or roller skating in a protected environment using sound stimuli. Their experiments show positive results with, with blind users. Ishwayundi et al. developed a visual aid tool for visual impaired people based on a convolutional neural network. The system is focused on object detection and object positioning. It accepts video that is connected to a camera, voice and commands are spoken by the user when he searches for an object, then the speech input is recognized by the device, and the system guides the user to find the object needed through the audio speaker output, and this tool will help the visually impaired people to identify objects and the positions of them. In our conclusion, when, when reviewing the previous studies, we can now mention the main characteristics uh, that our technology should have to help people with visual disabilities in their education. These characteristics are the following. The tool must be fully accessible with a screen reader. In other words, it should have a text-to-speech option to help the users with visual problems. The tool should be able to use in any kind of device. This is because sometimes uh, some devices are more accessible than others. And also some, some people with uh, disabilities, sometimes they are more comfortable to use a certain type of device. So it should be good to, to these technologies be able to use in any kind of, of device. This can be uh, tablets, uh, cell phones, uh, web. Uh, also, you should be able to use the tool without having to be in a specific place. The tool should have a good usability. And finally, a multisensorial tool is highly recommended. The discoveries of new technologies in teaching methods not only help in the exclusive, inclusive education, but they also help to increase their confidence. The development of these teaching methods will help the visual impairment students to focus on the topic and the topics they, per they prefer, and not only in the topics that are naturally accessible to them. When multisensorial technologies not only help people with disabilities, but they also see and learn, help to see uh, and learn different ways. So these technologies can enhance the knowledge of people without disabilities. Um, in Mexico in 2020, in the population census, it was reported that more than 20 million people have a disability. That is more than 16% of percent of the entire population of the country. In this census, it will also report that more than 12 million people have a visual problem, making this the most common disability in Mexico. Therefore, it is necessary to develop an new assistive technologies to aid people that are, are visually impaired. These are s the references used in, the, in this presentation. Thank you.
Hello everyone, my name is Ahmed Abdul Momin Ahmed. I'm assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science at Prairie View and the University. Today I'm gonna present my research paper, Allocation Based Mobile Advertising System for Small uh, to Medium Businesses. So this research was uh, funded by um, National Science Foundation um, and it was a collaboration work with my former master's students, Anissa Bolosa. So uh, the motivation of this work is that uh, small to medium businesses are always seeking affordable ways to advertise their products and services securely. With the emergence of mobile technology, it is possible than ever to implement innovative location-based advertising system using smartphones that preserve the privacy of mobile users. Imagine adver an advertisement system that can be easily used by business owners to create free ads for job opening, discounts on a newly offered meal, or a brand new service, while potential customers in their neighborhood could easily view their ads conveniently using their smartphones. So this system would uh, create a better opportunities for business owners to target the right customers at the right time, which will increase their sales or offering more services to more customers and attract uh, more customers in the neighborhood and that will increase the revenues. Such systems could also uh, could be also used by business owners to track the movement of customers passing by their stores, determine the rush shopping hours and create efficient staffing plans. So given all of these motivation, we drafted the objective of this work as First, develop a distributed LBS system that helps small to business, uh, small to medium business advertisers to advertise uh, various ads affordably. The develop system is organized with parts executing on the mobile and devices at the user side, as well as high performance servers hosted on the cloud. We, second, we propose a multimodal uh, sensing approach for programming context-aware sensing of mobile applications separately from their function concerns. And this actually uh, would lead to a significant power saving at the mobile devices. Third, the system is designed to be generic, which means that it could be applicable to different fields requiring real-time processing and using sensors such as in the transportation field. So this is the overall design of our system and this figure shows the system architecture. As we can see here at the bottom, we have a database layer which we store all the information related to the system. And we have here um, the maps ABI, which we use basically to, um, to track the movement of customers using um, our system at the mobile side. And we have an application server here which hosts basically the server side and hosts the database as well. So all parties are communicating using the REST service ABI. So the overall design um, is organized with parts executing on the application and database servers hosted on the cloud, as well as on the user mobile side. The communication between the different sides is coordinated through uh, a representable state transfer service layer, which we call it REST. So here is the second objective of this work. We introduced basically a novel multimodal mobile sensing. As we can see here from these two examples, maybe these two examples are relevant to this work, but it shows you the concept of the multimodal mobile sensing. As we in, in the left hand side, we have the smart home modes. Suppose that you are living in a smart house and then the smart house can track the current activity you are doing inside the house like dining, studying, partying, sleeping. Every activity, each activity of these, um, of these uh, different moods have, um, has a particular set of sensors to be collected and a particular uh, set of triggers to be measured in order to determine each mood. As we can see here on the right hand side, this is another example of a multimodal sensing human activity moods like walking, driving, bicycling, and just uh, stealing. Um, you are not doing anything. As we can see here, uh, from these two examples, they share a certain characteristics, which is the mood transition depends on the contextual factors which, which are sensed from the environment. 
But most, most of the developers who are developing mobile sensing application are mixing between the mode transition concerns with the functional concerns. In this work, we try to separate um, the uh, mode transition from the functional concerns. So that will lead to a modular uh, way of programming mobile sensing and also provide a significant uh, power saving. So um, this is how the mood sense or how the multimodal uh, sensing is working formally. We model and program the multimodal sensing requirements as a finite state machine. It's naturally defined or modeled uh, using a finite state machine M and this we have M0, um, M1, M2. So M here are the set of the finite modes which are represented in the system. Uh, and, um, and this one represents the triggers which, uh, which are represented by the input. And delta here is, um, is a transition machine, um, the transition function which can actually lead uh, to um, uh, moving from uh, one mode to another, from M0 to M1, for example, and we have T1, which is a trigger. That trigger actually is fired based on an input from here, from sigma. So M0 here represents the initial mode, which we uh, basically um, start um, the finite state machine from. So this is the business uh, on our side. And uh, this is an example of the um, JUJSON file, which we use to represent the geographical locations of businesses. And it is defined totally by our system using a nice, um, a friendly, nice and friendly uh, GUI uh, based web application. As we can see here, we have the type features, geometry and types, and we actually uh, provide uh, a growing area where the business owner can draw a polygon where is the business is located. And these are the coordinates and the other attributes. It's a G, um, each um, a GU, JSON object represents a set of features of a place location, including the multi-polygon geometry type of the place, which has its coordinates, size, and boundaries as well. In the implementation, uh, we separate between the business side and the mobile user side. In the business side, we implement it as a web-based application, which provides a customized dashboard for business owners to create a new ad, edit an existing ad, view applications in response of their ads, and approve reject requests as well. So we develop such system using PHP 7.4, MySQL 8, uh, HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript and JSON for sure. At the mobile side, it was implemented as a self-contained app which implements a multimodal mode sense approach which we developed using the Android Development Environment ADT bundle uh, CKST uh, for bet. So we developed the mobile app using Android SDK and XML to, to build the front-end activities, BHP 7.4 as a middleware between the app and database server on the cloud and MySQL 8 as well. So here are some screenshots of the business owner side. As we can see here, business owners must be registered in the system. So we provide first name, last name, mobile number, email, username and password, which is a very basic things to um, create uh, a new business owner. And then once the business owner is approved by the administrator, the user credentials need to be verified and authenticated on each page using the BHP sessions, and this is the login page. Uh, continuing on the screenshots of the business owner side, these, these, this page basically represents um, how uh, shows how the business owner can draw a polygon. As you can see, you can go to the map and then draw a polygon for specifying the boundary of their business. So we are not actually strictly defined by um, by the provided locations um, by Google Maps. We actually provide the flexibility for the business owner to allocate any area which actually he needs to um, attract customers. And you can provide the name of the store, the type of the advertisement and description and so on. And this is um, a list of all created um, uh, applications or, or, or places 
uh, and the advertisement as well. So this is um, some screenshots of the mobile user side. As we can see here, the mobile app enables the users to search and navigate um, to any destination supported by Google Maps, as well as the search functionality support um, the autocomplete option for increasing the user experience. And this is the landing page. As we can see here, this is a car, for example, if the user is driving. Continuing on the screenshots of the mobile um, user side, our system supports various types of ads, which are displayed on the map while driving between the starting location and destination point. As we can see here, the starting location, the destination point. And once we are driving, we have some pop up with some interesting um, advertisement, advertisement that the user would like to see along the way. This figure shows a class diagram of a uh, simple class diagram for, uh, for the application. As we can see here, we have different types of objects. We have um, Java classes, we have Android activities, and so on. And these are the interactions between um, this class diagram. I won't dive into the diagram here for the time limitation, but please refer to the paper for a description of each one of these. So for experimental evaluation, uh, we were very, very uh, interested in um, evaluating the performance of our application because basically we need this application to be running in real time and we would like to minimize the power consumption and processing um, processing time for executing the mobile app because mobile apps are needs to be very efficient on, on consuming uh, power on mobile devices. So our experimental evaluation used a specific case study involved human activity recognition. To measure the performance, we measure the ongoing processing costs measured in milliseconds of monitoring for mood transition triggers for each of the modes. As we can see here, we define four modes stealing, walking, bicycling, driving, and these are the three different types of sensors we uh, collect data from. And we have here old, means that it applies when the data is already collected for the mood function, which could be reutilized. But new, which applies when a fresh sensing is required to determine uh, whether we're gonna uh, transit from this mood to the next. We measured also the total cost for making a transition uh, from one of the four modes to another. And this is this table is really, really interesting. As we can see here, from walking to stealing, we take only 12.32 uh, milliseconds. Driving um, to bicycling, we took only 1.61. Why? Because basically the driving and bicycling are using the same set of sensors, which is um, the accelerometer and GPS, right? So using the GPS only, we could have a minimum number of, um, of second, milliseconds to detect that mood transition. So for experimental evaluation, we also measure the energy consumption, which is a critical factor in determining um, the efficiency of the multimodal sensing approach. So the ongoing energy cost for detecting mood transition triggers ranges between uh, 0.62 millijoule to 1.93 millijoule, which is a really, really small energy footprint for the application, which means that the customers, has, the mobile users, has to be assured that this application doesn't consume a lot of power from their mobile device. So the cost of changing the sensor sampling rates to carry out the mood transition ranges between 2.42 millijoule and 4.05 millijoule. And this is the breakdown of these numbers. We also measure the ongoing and bare mood transition. The ongoing is a very minor thing than the usual, ranging between, as we said, 0.63 to 1.93 for the GPS. And the bare mood transition is slightly bigger than that because it's basically it happens only when we need to change the transition between bicycling to driving, um, stealing, and walking. So in conclusion, um, in this paper, we presented um, a mobile-based LBS system that helps small to medium businesses to advertise various types of ads affordably. We developed two different types of applications as part of a distributed system executing on the cloud servers and user mobile devices. 
We presented also a novel approach for programming context-aware sensing of multimodal mobile applications separately from their function concerns, leading to a more modular code. So the mode transition logic can be easily specified using appropriate finite state machine, and we carried out um, a several set of experiments uh, for evaluating the performance and scalability of our mobile site, specifically the mobile application. And we paid actually a particular attention to establishing the relationship between the number of ads hosted on the mobile device and the response time of the overall system. And we, and we figured out, we found that um, the overall performance is very, very good compared to the functionality that it provides. So also we uh, provided the source code and data uh, set available publicly on this GitHub link. So if you can click on that, it will lead you to a GitHub where people can, um, other researchers can use the system uh, for free and try to replicate the results that we implemented here in this, um, in this paper. So for the future work, we are examining the composition of our work on multimodal sensing, mode sense with another approach we call it share sense to support the sharing of data between applications with multimodal sensing requirements. Our work addressing this challenge has the potential of making it possible to simultaneously serve multiple sensing heavy applications on a single mobile device. Finally, experiments with more massive datasets are needed to study the robustness of our solution further. So this research is supported in part by the National Science Foundation NSF under the grant number 2011330. So any opinion so any opinions, finding, conclusions expressed in this paper are those of the authors and don't necessarily reflect the NSF views. Thank you everyone and I hope to um, get some feedback on um, the online um, uh, online conference. Thank you and take care. Bye bye.